All right, welcome back, everyone. Uh, happy to jump into the second half of this. I uh, had a lot of interesting conversations during the break. I'll just mention uh, one clarification very briefly, lest you guys are misled. Uh, so when I talk about instruction reordering, I just wanted to make it clear that uh, reordering is like an abstraction. It's, uh, it's, it's a way of thinking about stuff that's happening deep in the architecture of the CPU. So deep in the architecture of the CPU, there are store buffers. Sometimes there are, you know, there are line fill buffers in the cache. Sometimes there are various read buffers. And uh, reordering is just how we kind of describe. It's, it's, a, it's a, uh, a way of modeling uh, in a simple way what's happening in, in a class of architectures. So for just as an example, in Intel, you have a store buffer. So when you do writes, you don't immediately write to memory because writes take a long time. So what you do is you, you put a write in a buffer. And then you keep executing in your code. And you run into another write, and you put it in your buffer. And you keep executing in your code. And if everything in your code was basically writes and reads, what's the effect of buffering those writes? So you're, you're buffering a write, putting it on the back burner, and then executing some reads. And buffering a write, putting it on the back burner, and then executing some reads. So that's, we just think of that as moving reads before writes. So just wanted to clarify that it's, it's a model uh, for what's happening at the architectural level. OK, so that clarification out of the way, let's uh, jump into the second half of this talk. So in the first half, uh, we talked almost exclusively about problems that could be solved by partitioning data, sharding it, slicing it up, and having threads access different parts of data with almost no sharing or no sharing at all of data. And so if you can do this to solve your problems, then it's a good idea to do this. This is a very fast, very scalable way of solving problems. So if you have partitionable data, like you know, static data structures that don't change, you're just reading from, uh, you know, data structures with very regular patterns, grids, arrays, these are all excellent candidates for partitioning. And how do you, you know, sort of efficiently solve problems this way? Well, you can use a single machine like we've been looking at here, or you can even use cluster computing. You can use sort of you know, uh, Spark, Hadoop, MapReduce kind of paradigm stuff to solve these problems. So if you have partitionable data, great, partition it process it, merge. This is all sort of the, the paradigm that we covered in the first half. OK, if you can't partition your data, or if it's not easy to, for example, you have some big complicated graph. How do I partition this graph? <laughs> not really clear where I should draw boundaries here, right? Uh, you know, figuring out how to partition this graph so that like the, you know, when I run an algorithm on the graph, uh, a minimal amount of data has to cross the partition boundaries. That's actually like a super hard problem that's pro probably as hard as whatever graph problem I'm trying to solve on this graph. Okay, so if you have dynamic data structures, graphs, you know, some kinds of trees, queues, uh, things that require a lot of, you know, sort of, that have a lot of dynamic data dependencies and require a lot of communication, then uh, that's where we use a, a large multi-core system, and this is you know, mostly the space where I live. Uh, so in this case, we, we want to share data. We want to synchronize with locks, fetch and add, et cetera. So that's what we're going to talk about in uh, this half of the talk. OK, so uh, I'm going to briefly introduce a dictionary abstract data type. Uh, this is you know, also called a map or a KV store. I'm sure like 95% of you have heard of this. Let's just say uh, you know, exactly what the specification of the operations we're going to be providing here are. So we have insert, which inserts a key value pair. If the key already exists, you replace the value associated with the key. We have delete, which deletes a key and its associated value. And we have search, which finds a key and returns the associated value. OK, and one way of implementing dictionaries is to use binary search trees. So presumably, you've all heard of binary search trees. So what's an internal or node-oriented binary search tree? This is the kind that are typically taught in an undergrad degree. Uh, so in such a data structure, insertion is, is fairly easy. Suppose we want to insert seven. We first search for the place where we're going to insert. So we go right from six. We go left from eight. We insert here. We create a new node and link it in. OK, delete. Deleting a leaf is easy. Let's say we want to delete nine. We search for nine, and we disconnect the leaf. Uh, deleting a node with one child is pretty easy. So if we want to delete uh, eight, we can just sort of reroute the right pointer of six. So instead of pointing to eight, it just points to seven. Now it's deleting a, ch a, a, a node with two children that's hard, because for this, we have to find the predecessor 
of the key in the node. So suppose we want to delete six. So we have to find the predecessor of six. That's the largest key to the left. So how do we get to that key? We go left and then we go all the way to the right. We find five is the predecessor of six. And we uh, move, we sort of copy five upwards in the tree. So we copy five up and we replace six by five. Since that was the largest key in the left subtree, everything in the left subtree is now smaller, with the exception of this stupid copy of five that we have to get rid of. And we, now we've reduced the problem of deleting a node with two children to the problem of deleting a leaf. So we break off that five that's a leaf. Okay? So this is an internal binary search tree. Now the trick is, in a concurrent setting, we have to move that predecessor up atomically. Well, this is kind of tricky, because if you have, for example, uh, a thread that's trying to find 37, and maybe it's already done a little bit of work, it started and it went left from 40, 37 smaller than 40, and then we also concurrently have a delete of 40. So the delete of 40, it's going to replace 40 by the predecessor. What's the predecessor? It's 37. So this thread that's deleting 40 is going to go down and find 37, copy it up, disconnect the leaf containing 37 from the tree, and then this other thread that's finding 37, maybe now it resumes its execution, continues its search for 37, and it doesn't find it. Okay, this is a problem because 37 has actually been in the tree throughout this whole time. In this whole example execution that I showed you, there's never a time when 37 was deleted. And yet here we have a search failing to find 37. So, a little bit tricky. And the way we got around this issue in concurrent search trees is by using a different kind of binary search tree. We used not internal or node-oriented search trees, we used external or leaf-oriented binary search trees. So uh, these are data structures where the leaves contain the real keys and, and maybe pointers to values or the values themselves. So all the keys and values that are in the dictionary are stored in the leaves. And okay, so what's in the internal nodes? Well, these are just dummy keys that exist to route you to the correct leaf. So those keys are not necessarily in the dictionary itself. And you might have some duplicate keys. For example, here we have two copies of key five, two copies of key four. So the search tree property is a little bit different. Normally in a search tree, you think if it's smaller, go left. If it's bigger, go right. What, if what you're looking for is smaller or bigger than the key that you're at. Yep. Why, why is the root six and not five? Uh, because this tree happens to have six at the root? Well, the dummy keys end up existing because they're like an emergent property of the algorithm for inserting and deleting. So you'll see where they come from. Okay. So uh, let's, uh, let's show how you actually modify such a tree, and we'll see where the dummy keys actually come from. So uh, when you insert, you navigate to the place where the key should be inserted. That place is always a leaf in such a tree. And you're gonna add a leaf and a parent, an, a, a, a parent containing a dummy key. Why are you doing this? Because, well, let's say you wanna insert seven. So seven is bigger than six, so we go to the right. So it should sort of be inserted, you know, uh, in place of nine, kind of in the same place as nine is where seven should go. Uh, of course, something is already there. Nine is already there. So, well, we need to insert something. Uh, in an internal tree, you would insert seven as a left child of nine. In an external tree, you create a new leaf containing seven, and you create a new parent node, and you link nine as a child of the new parent. So you sort of take a leaf and replace it with like a triple of nodes. Or equivalently, you take a leaf, move it, and insert uh, a new parent. So what's this parent doing? It's helping you decide when I get to nine. Previously, when I got to nine, I was where I needed to be. It was a leaf. I sort of, there was nowhere else I could go. Now, when I get to the place where nine was, now I need to make a decision. Do I go left or right? And so how do I decide? Well, I need a dummy key to tell me how to decide. So uh, what's the search tree property in the binary search tree? If, if we're looking for a key that's smaller, we go left. If we're looking for a key that's greater or equal to the key we're looking for, 
or sorry, to the key of the node. We go to the right. So smaller, we go left. Greater or equal, we go to the right. So uh, how do we preserve the search tree property if greater or equal is going to the right, smaller is going to the left? There are a bunch of different options we could plug in for this node. An easy one is uh, just put nine up there. If we're searching for nine, we're looking for something greater or equal, so we go to the right. Otherwise, we go to the left, to seven. So we're inserting a new dummy node. We're taking the key from one of the children, the larger of the two children. So this is where our dummy keys are coming from. In a sense, the dummy keys are keys that were in the data structure at some point. They might still be in the data structure, or they might not. But certainly they were there. They came from node, leaf nodes that were in the data structure. OK, and here's the magic of an external binary search tree. The delete is easy. So since all the keys are stored in the leaves, every time you delete, you're deleting a leaf. And so when I delete the leaf, uh, I can actually get rid of the, the dummy parent above, because that dummy parent exists to help you decide, do I go you know, one direction to this leaf that, I, that you're deleting, or do I go the other direction to the rest of the tree? Well, that, that decision is trivial now. I should go the other direction to the rest of the tree. So why not get rid of that node that just exists to help me make that decision of left or right? I can get rid of the leaf, and I can get rid of the parent node that contains the dummy key. So for example, if I'm deleting two, I don't need the parent node containing four, because I don't need help deciding which direction to go. I, I should just go to the other subtree containing five if I'm searching. So I get rid of that, those two nodes, the leaf and its parent, and just change the left pointer of six so it points to five. OK, so insert and delete are kind of symmetric. You insert a leaf and a parent. You delete a leaf and a parent. And so you have these two really simple cases. And the modifications intuitively are both kind of local in the tree. They're happening at a leaf, and it's just like right there at a leaf and its parent. Unlike the internal or node-oriented search tree, where I had to find a predecessor maybe way deeper in the tree and like move the predecessor up and delete a leaf down here. And, and sort of the concurrent, it was like concurrency at a distance, atomicity at a distance. Here we have just sort of small local operations that are easier to think about. So external binary search trees are what cracked the space open for lock-free search trees uh, prior to the first external binary search tree showing up as a lock-free data structure. Uh, I think there had been no successful uh, lock-free binary search trees, and I think people had been trying to do it for uh, at least 20 years prior to that. So at some point, somebody had this idea to use an external binary search tree, and then all of a sudden, tons and tons of binary search trees appeared. So the cons of this external binary search tree data structure is that you have around two times as many nodes as an internal search tree, because now all the internal nodes are useless, and the leaves are, well, useless. They don't contain real data. They're not useless. They direct us to the right leaves. And, and of course, then you have all the leaves. So it's about two times as many nodes. And also searches, uh, they always have to go to a leaf to find the key they're looking for. So you might have to go a little bit deeper. I say a little bit, even though it seems like you might have to go a lot deeper, uh, because in a balanced binary search tree, for example, uh, half of the nodes are leaves, a quarter of them are, are parents of leaves, an eighth of them are parents of those. So uh, like 82% uh, of the nodes are within distance two of the leaves. <laughs> So already, if you're just searching for keys in the tree uniformly randomly, most of the places you end up in an internal tree are near a leaf. So it's not that much deeper in an external tree. But you do have to search a little deeper. OK, and the big pro is you don't need this atomic move operation. You don't have these sort of atomicity at a distance problem where you have to work on the predecessor. OK, so suppose we wanted to implement a concurrent binary search tree. Well, there are lots of, you know, maybe you want to use this as like an index for an in-memory database or something like that. Uh, so there are lots of different approaches for doing this. Uh, and uh, what, I, what I usually like to do in a concurrent setting is just start with the absolute simplest thing I can start with. Uh, anything else will make you tear your hair out. Um, so start with the simplest thing you can, you can think of and then only make it more complex if that's not good enough. So what are some simple approaches that we could use? Uh, we could try using a global lock. So what is that like? Uh, by the way, some of these diagrams are going to be internal binary search trees, because I, I, I borrowed them from a different presentation, even though we're talking about external binary search trees here. It doesn't really matter. The important part for these slides where I'm demoing synchronization mechanisms is the synchronization mechanism, not the, the particular shape of the tree. 
Uh, so what would an insert of E look like? Well, the important part is you lock the whole data structure. While you have it locked, no other thread can access it. You do a sequential insertion of E, whatever the sequential algorithm is that's appropriate for whatever type of data structure you're doing, and then you unlock. Okay, so this is clearly thread safe. How does it perform? Terribly, right? <laughs> so there's no scaling. Okay, we get about 3 million operations per second in a tree that contains 100,000 keys. Here we've got n threads performing searches only, up to 36 threads. And we're measuring the number of searches per second. Okay, so really badly, right? Uh, the concurrency bottleneck is quite obvious. If you don't have any concurrency, you can't have any scaling. Okay, how about a reader-writer lock? So a reader-writer lock, if we're doing a search, I can take the lock as a reader, as a book there, so it's a reader. Okay, and the little number is how many readers there are on the lock. Okay, now if another search comes along, he can join this other reader. Multiple readers can read at the same time. Okay, another search comes along, he can join. Now there are three searches accessing the tree concurrently. Now if a writer comes along, the writer must be alone in the system. There can be no readers concurrent with a writer. There can be no other writers concurrent with a writer. Okay, how does this perform? Surprisingly well, not too badly. So with 36 threads, we get about 15 million searches a second. Might be good enough for your application, perhaps. This is the same workload as the previous slide. So it's a binary search tree containing 100,000 keys, and n threads are repeatedly searching for uniform random keys in the, in the tree. They're just searching. So this is, this is just a search experiment. So you'll see the next question I'm gonna ask is how much do updates hurt? So this is just searching. If it's a 100% search workload, yes. You don't need the locking at all, right? I mean, if it's a 100% search workload, I, I don't need to be here. You can, <laughs> you can solve that. <laughs> okay, oh yeah? between 6 and 18. Why uh, there was a why do we have, between 6 okay. and 18? So why, the question is, why do we have no real scaling between 6 and 18 threads, and then presumably we have some scaling afterwards? Probably I did something suboptimal in my experiment and made some minor mistakes that uh, have led to poor scaling there and slightly better scaling thereafter. I mean, I'll tell you, in terms of architecture on this system, we have cores up to 18 threads, and, the, and then we have hyper threads up to 36 threads. So somehow here the hyper threads are helping. Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure why in this particular example. I didn't scrutinize this example really carefully, okay, so this, uh, this uh, experiment. But I've done other experiments like this before where I trust the results more, and this is more or less consistent. But you're right to ask about weird scaling effects like that. That's fair. So it is sort of unusual that while I'm still in the realm of cores, my scaling is crappy, and then once I start adding hyperthreads, the scaling increases. I agree, that's a little bit strange. Maybe if I reran this experiment and was very careful about making sure I missed every, you know, got every instance of false sharing and things like that, the result might look a little bit different. I don't think it would look a lot different, though, at least not in the absolute throughput you reach at the end. Okay, so here's a slightly different experiment. So uh, here we have 20% updates and 80% searches. So same tree size, same number of threads. Just uh, now we have 20% updates. And the updates are 10% uh, inserts and 10% deletes on uniform random keys. Uh, and uh, this performs terribly. It's no better than a global lock. Okay, so reader-writer locks, I mean, they're really only feasible with a very low write rate, like, like decently below 1%. Uh, so if you have an application where you have decently below 1% writes, then they can actually be a really good option. Uh, but if you have anything more than that, then they don't do very well. Okay, so uh, we'd like to do something better than a reader-writer lock. Uh, these are sort of our two coarse-grained techniques, a global lock and a reader-writer lock. There are other coarse-grained techniques as well, but I, I won't get into details on them here. It's not really the point of the talk. Okay, so here's a fine-grained approach you could take. You could try hand-over-hand -hand locking. So who here has heard of hand-over-hand -hand locking? Okay, so 20%. Uh, okay, so what's hand-over-hand -hand locking? 
So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to lock the root. While we hold the lock on the root, we're going to lock the next node. And then we can release the lock on the root and grab a lock on the next node. Release the previous lock, grab the next lock, and so on. So uh, this is like climbing a mountain. You can't let go with both hands or you fall off and die. Uh, so you always have to keep one lock. So, you, so there's never a time when you don't hold a lock. This has a bunch of properties, like threads can't overtake one another, and threads can't have deleted the node that you're locked, and various nice properties that follow from that locking discipline. OK, and then when you end up at the node you want to modify, you modify it, and then you release the lock. OK, so how should this help? Uh, well, there is a concurrency bottleneck, right, because every thread has to lock the root. But if the tree is very wide and very deep, then hopefully, you know, the thread locks the root, locks the next node, releases it, now another thread can lock the root. You know, and then it locks the next node and releases it, and you, you, can, you can get guys, in, they're entering one at a time. But if they spread out, you can start to get concurrency, right? You hope. Here's how it performs. Where is it? <laughs> it's below the global lock. So, so hand over hand locking is, is way down there at the bottom. This is strange. Yeah, there's still no real scaling. And the question is why? So, I mean, all operations lock the root. But that, you know, that is a global bottleneck. It's sort of like a global lock in some sense. But they release it earlier than you would release the global lock. So you would expect some scaling, but we don't get it. So the answer is it comes down to cache coherence. So how does hand over hand locking interact with cache coherence? Uh, well, when we acquire the first lock, in order to acquire that lock, we must acquire that cache line containing the lock in exclusive mode. Okay, while it's held in exclusive mode, no other thread may access it, not even to read it. And then while we hold it in exclusive mode, we write to it. It must get a modified tag in the cache. We have to invalidate that cache line in all of the other processor caches. So you have to evict that cache line for all threads. Then we lock the next node and we evict that cache line for all threads. Then we unlock the first node and evict that cache line again for all threads. Then we lock the next node and evict that cache line for all threads. And so on and so forth. So hand over hand locking leaves a trail of destruction in the processor caches. You just shred the caches for all threads. So of course, when we do these evictions, the next time someone accesses it, they're, they're cache missing and they're going you know, at least to the L3 in a Yuma system and all the way to main memory or even remote memory on a NUMA system. And so you, prior to seeing this, you might have wondered how bad can that effect be? And the answer is bad enough to make it way worse than a global lock. Um, and if you plug this into perf stat or you know, perf record and look at cache misses, you'll see that there's a crap ton of cache misses <laughs> created by this. Okay, so uh, that's not very encouraging that even the fine-grained approaches perform really horribly, right? So how do you achieve high performance? Yeah. Okay, so the question was, why doesn't this happen, uh, why doesn't this cache shredding happen uh, in the global lock case? Why does the global lock perform better than this? And it's true, the global lock experiences w way fewer cache misses. And so this is because when you take the global lock, you evict the cache line holding the global lock from all threads' caches. And so the next time someone takes the global lock, they will cache miss on that global lock, yes. But they're not writing in the actual data structure. And there's only one global lock they have to take. So they take one extra cache miss for the global lock. And then in this particular case on this server, it's a 40 meg cache. And this is 100,000 nodes in a binary search tree. The whole binary search tree fits in the L3 cache. So in fact, in the global lock case, you're taking one miss on the global lock and no cache misses when traversing the tree. And here you're taking a cache miss on almost every node that you hit in the tree. Okay? Yep. Uh, sorry, uh, can you repeat that? With fine grained locking. So, well, a hand over hand locking is fine grained, right? We're all, like, a, a thread is only holding at most two, two locks at a time. 
Can, can we achieve better? Oh yeah, we can do way better. Yeah, we're gonna talk about how we do better next. Yeah, if we couldn't do better, that would be really depressing. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, how do we do better? Uh, well, unfortunately, the dirty secret here is that after about a decade of research on high-performance data structures, um, I, I think almost everybody in the, in, in the area has converged on the same answer, and that is you can't lock while you search. If you lock while you search, you're going to shred the caches, you know, evict all these nodes, you know, from the cache as you traverse. This is a problem. So you just can't lock while you search. You have to search without locking. And of course, if you're searching without locking, the big question then is how do you know that what you're doing is correct? How do you guarantee that you've got a correct algorithm? Because if you search without locking, you're ignoring locks. Maybe you're ob observing changes as they're in the middle of happening. Maybe you see, you know, corrupted pictures of the data structure. How do you even know if you've seen a corrupted picture of the data structure? So, okay, we'll see, we'll see sort of one example of how this can be done right here. I don't claim that this can be generalized. Okay. So, uh, as an experiment, let's just see, oh, sorry, was there was a question? Uh, so, I was wondering, isn't the next naive step to kind of say searching and updating, deleting, whatever, should just acquire two locks on, like, the leave and the node top of that? Yeah. I mean, that, that would be much better than the global lock, I would assume. Maybe yep. that's a wrong perception, but... No, it would be, definitely. Yep. You, so you mean, are you, you're, you're proposing searching without locking, and then when you end up where you want to be, locking a couple nodes and making your change. Yeah, so that, that's essentially what's oh, okay. <laughs> suggested there. Although, I think that wasn't on the screen when you had your question. There is another question. Sorry, but again, would it be correct? Uh, if you don't if you search without logs, it wouldn't be correct. We're, we're about to see that. Ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> That's fine. So the question was, you know, are you sure it's correct if we search without logs? And the answer is no. I'm definitely not sure that it's correct. It can be correct. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see. We'll see how it's not correct, and we'll see how it can be. Okay. So so what if we search with no locks? Just lock the nodes we want to change or delete. Make our changes and unlock. It's kind of the, the best we could hope for, maybe from a performance standpoint. Only lock the nodes we need to. Don't lock while searching. Okay, so what does it look like? So uh, there are a couple things that can go wrong. So here's, here's one thing, hazard number one. Uh, accidentally changing deleted nodes. So here we have a thread that wants to insert E. Uh, again, this is a diagram for an internal binary search tree. It doesn't really matter which type of tree it is for this example. So if this thread searches for the place where it wants to insert, it's gonna to want to insert E as a right child of C. So it searches down to C, and now before it locks or does anything else, this thread's gonna to go to sleep. It's gonna be context switched out, whatever, it's gonna stop taking steps for a few moments. Scheduler gets to choose when things run, can happen. And so now, now a thread two comes along and it wants to delete C. Okay, so thread two searches for C. Uh, it finds the parent of C. The parent of C it wants to modify, right? It wants to change the left pointer of F to get rid of C. So we'll, it'll lock, thread two will lock F, thread two will lock C. It'll disconnect C from the data structure, it'll unlink it. It'll remove both the locks and its operation is done. It has deleted C. Now thread one wakes up and it says, okay, let's lock C. I want to change C's right child pointer. I create E and I change its right child pointer and I unlock and I'm done. I successfully inserted E. Well, I mean, e, e was in fact inserted somewhere. It was just inserted into a deleted part of the tree. So modifying deleted nodes is dangerous. This is, you know, a basic thing that uh, concurrent data structures has to prevent, the modification of deleted parts of the data structure. Okay, so here's another problem that can happen. You can observe partial changes. Sort of see a corrupted picture of the, of the data structure and do something stupid as a result. Okay, so imagine now that we have a, a balanced binary search tree. So what's the difference between an unbalanced, you know, just a regular binary search tree like we were talking about, and a balanced one? Balanced ones usually have some sort of rotations to, to maintain balance. So you say, you know, oh, this tree is too long on the left side. Let's do a little three node rotation 
rooted at the node C, let's take those nodes A, B, C that are like this and just flip them up so they make a little triangle. I make one side, the long side of the tree shallower so the tree is more balanced now. Okay, so here's a rotation that could happen in a balanced binary search tree. Uh, and so what would the rotating thread do? It'd probably lock F, C, B, and A and then start making its changes. So what are the changes it's gonna make? Well, looking at the right side of the diagram, I can see the left child of F has to be B. And right now the left child of F is C. So we're gonna change the left child of F from, from C to B. Okay, pause. <laughs> this thread goes to sleep, okay? Now remember, our searches are ignoring locks. So another thread comes along searching for C. Now it can't hope to find C right now because transiently, temporarily, C is removed from the data structure. Semantically, C is in the data structure, right? It hasn't been deleted, but physically it's not in the data structure right now. So this thread will skip over to B, it'll look to the right of B because C is greater than B, it'll say, you know what, C's not there. Okay, so because we observed a change that was in progress, we've given an incorrect answer. C has been semantically in the dictionary at all times throughout the search of C. That means this search that returns not found fundamentally is gonna be a non-linearizable search. It gives an incorrect answer. Okay, so this seems kinda nasty. Okay, so, so this is one of the reasons that implementing balanced binary search trees is actually quite hard to do without taking locks. You can do it, you can, I've done it. <laughs> I have a bunch of data structures like this. If you're curious to see how they work, I have, you know, you can go to my website, which is on the first slide, and. I have, uh, my CV has links to all my papers, and I, I've done several papers on binary search trees that are like this, that are lock-free, if you're curious. I also have code up there for them. Okay, so we're not gonna see binary search trees, sorry, balanced binary search trees here. Balanced ones are too complicated for this talk. Let's just go back to the simple external binary search tree case, and let's see how you could implement a concurrent external binary search tree correctly using locks that doesn't lock while searching. Okay, so this is the ticket locking external BST of David, Garawi, and Trigonakis, and uh, its searches are just a standard sequential binary search tree search. There's no synchronization, it just, it just reads and decides, left or right, read, left or right, that's it. Okay, and then how do you do updates? Well, you start with that nice sequential synchronization free binary search tree search to find out where you wanna do your modification, and then you lock the internal nodes that you're gonna change or you're gonna unlink from the data structure. Uh, why the internal ones only? Uh, this, this data structure maintains an invariant that the leaves are never changed. So if the leaves are never changed, you don't have to lock them, you don't have to do anything else fancy with them. So we, so we lock the internal nodes that we're gonna change or unlink. And then we check if a node is marked. What the heck is a mark? So we're gonna introduce this concept of marking which is gonna help us avoid changes to deleted nodes. So as soon as we've locked all the nodes we wanna work with, we check if any of them are marked. If any of the nodes are marked, we're gonna release all our locks and go, crap, we observed something we shouldn't have, go back to the beginning. Search again, try our update again. And then if we see that no nodes are marked, all the locked nodes are not marked, we're okay to continue. So any of the nodes that we're going to unlink, that we're gonna delete, we mark. So there's a mark field in these nodes, like a Boolean, we just set the mark to true. And then we're gonna perform our update, either an insert or a delete, depending on what we're supposed to do, by changing a single pointer. So we're gonna organize this update so we only have to change a single pointer to make the update happen. Okay, so how does that work? Well, if we're trying to insert seven, this is an external binary search tree. So when we insert, we insert a leaf, and a new internal node apparent. So what we do is we search for seven. So we search, we don't acquire any locks while we're searching. What do we find? We find seven should be inserted uh, where this node nine is. And so we're gonna end up changing the right child pointer of six. So we're gonna lock six. Uh, and then we don't actually have to lock anything else in this case, because we're not gonna change any other node. We're just gonna change the right pointer of six. Now we create our new leaf and our new internal node. The internal node will have the key nine. The leaf will have the key seven. 
And then we change that single pointer to insert those two nodes. So when we create those two nodes, when we create node 9, it has pointers to 7, or the, the, to, this, to this internal node 9. It has pointers, we create it with pointers to these two nodes. So the only pointer we're changing is this one, the right pointer of 6. Okay. So with a single pointer change, which is an indivisible step, so we're avoiding observing partial changes, uh, we insert these two nodes. Okay, so how about delete? So this is the slightly more complex case. So suppose we want to delete two. So we go search for two, we find this leaf containing two, and we find its parent and its grandparent. And how are we gonna delete two? We're gonna get rid of two, and we're gonna get rid of this internal load containing four, we're going to change the left pointer of 6 to point to this internal load 5. Okay, so, so we lock this node, this 6, because we're going to change its left pointer. We lock this node 4 because we're going to unlink it. And then we, we mark node 4 because we're going to unlink it. So we mark it. I don't have an animation for that, but imagine there's a big X drawn through 4 now. And then we change a single pointer, the left pointer of 6, to point to this instead. Okay, and we unlock. Okay, so remember hazard one, changing deleted nodes. This is prevented by marking. So how is this prevented by marking? Before I unlink a node, I mark it. Before I change a node, I check if it's marked. I change the mark bit while it's locked, and I read the mark bit while the node is locked. So here's the handshake. I'm about to delete it. I have the node locked. I mark it, and then I delete it. Now suppose some thread was sitting at that node, waiting to change it. How do we know that it won't be able to change it? Well, when that thread tries to acquire the lock, it'll acquire the lock on that now deleted node. It'll check the mark bit, it'll see it's marked, and it'll just give up. It'll unlock and it'll search again from the root of the tree. So that's sort of a, a Intuitive argument about why marking will prevent changes to deleted nodes. Yeah? How do you manage these? So the question was, if we're in C++, of course, it's, a, it's an unmanaged language, so we have to actually reclaim memory, right? So how do you actually reclaim memory? How do you actually free or delete, like using the delete operator in, in C++, this thing? Yes, so, so th this, is, uh, this is something that I originally was going to talk about in the talk, and then I pushed it into bonus slides at the end because I ran out of time. But the question is, uh, when, do, when, when is it safe for us to actually, once we disconnect 4 from the data structure here, we've just unlinked it, we haven't freed it. When is it safe to free it? Because remember, there could be a thread sitting at 4, about to access it, about to try to lock it, and that thread could sit there for a very long time until right before we, you know, uh, right after we free it. So anytime we're about to free the node, there could be a thread sitting there about to access it right after we free it, like segvault on that node. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a hard question. So memory reclamation gets way more complicated as soon as you uh, remove the locking from searches, because now the searches can be anywhere. You don't have any real hint as to where they are. And so there are algorithms, for example, uh, epic-based memory reclamation and hazard pointers that are designed to help you solve that problem you usually tell that you make some call, like a delayed free call, and you pass the node, and then the, that other memory reclamation algorithm is responsible for figuring out when no threads have pointers to it so that it's safe to, to free. Okay. Okay, so that was hazard one, changing deleted nodes, and how it's prevented by marking. Hazard two, observing partial changes. This is prevented by the fact that our, each of our changes that we make in terms of the structure of the tree, like the pointers and the keys and the values, the changes that we're making to insert or delete are just change one pointer, change one pointer. Like, yeah, we mark also, that's a second step. But the searches don't care about the marks. The searches actually don't look at the marks at all. They just look at the pointers and the keys and the values. And from the perspective of the data structure, restricted to the set of pointers, keys, and values, these changes are a single change, changing one child pointer to insert, changing one child pointer to delete. So how can you see a partial update? Either you see the child pointer in its changed state and you've seen the update, the whole update, or you, you read the pointer before it gets changed, in which case you didn't see the whole update at all. You saw none of the update. 
So you can't observe partial changes. OK. So how does this perform? Very well. <laughs> so this is the same graph as before, but the scale has changed a little bit. So you see there, you still have the global lock and hand over hand and the reader writer lock. But now the reader writer lock is really dwarfed by the search performance of this data structure. Now this is the search performance. But if I plug in, I, I, sorry, I don't have a graph here. It's my, it's my oversight not to have an update graph to show you how, what the performance of the updates, but, but the performance of the updates is not much worse than this. The updates actually do really well because yes, every time you take a lock, you're sort of evicting that cache line from caches, but where do you take the locks? The modifications all happen at the leaves of the tree. You were probably gonna cache miss near the leaves by the time you reach the leaves of the tree anyway in a large tree. And in that case, the cache miss is expected. The cost of doing a write there and causing the next thread to access that to cache miss is sort of hidden in the fact that unless your entire tree is stored in the cache, you're already gonna get some cache misses near the leaves. So the cost of updates in this tree is actually not that high. So the fact that I'm, I'm locking a few nodes is not really the big deal. The fact that those few nodes are near the leaves is a big deal. Well, it's also nice that I'm only locking a few nodes. Okay. And so the key here is that this just does these regular BST searches with no synchronization. We're not writing when we really want to be reading. That's the problem with hand over hand locking. You really mean to be reading, but you're writing <laughs> along the way. Every node you're locking, and locking involves changing the lock word, which is a write to memory. OK, so the hard part of this, this work, this DGT BST, is actually just arguing that the search works, arguing that the search is atomic, because the search is a whole bunch of independent steps with no locking. But you still have to argue that effectively, there's a time in the execution where it's as if I did the search atomically at that time. That's, that's the hard part. And then, of course, updates. You might think, well, updates use locks. It's easy to argue that they're atomic. But remember, before you can do the update, you have to search. So you still sort of have to argue that the searches are atomic in order to get really, really anywhere in this argument. And the problem with this approach is that it's really not easy to see how these techniques can be extended to more complex data structures, because we, we avoided observing partial changes by just making all of our changes happen with one pointer change. OK, you can do that. For what data structures? Well, data structures where it just so happens you can make one pointer change and change everything you need to. So this is not necessarily the most generalizable technique. And I wish I had a nice, easy technique that's you know, uh, superior in every way that I could share with you, but I don't think there is one. <laughs> At least we don't know of one. So we have tools, and fundamentally, the hard part is arguing that searches work. Uh, you, know, you can do a bunch of locks. You can use a, a fancy multi-word compare and swap primitive that you can implement from single word compare and swap. That'll help you make your updates atomic. But fundamentally, you still have to argue that your searches are atomic. So that is a hard and, I, in, in my mind, somewhat open problem in this area. OK. So that's my sort of deviation into data structures, and it, it'll sort of help motivate some of these performance pitfalls that we're going to talk about. But I want to talk now a little bit about some hardcore performance pitfalls in this kind of programming of these shared data structures. OK, so the first one, bloated nodes. So many programmers don't pay a whole lot of attention to object size. They think, well, if I make the object a little bit bigger, it you know, probably won't change that much about it. Um, so this, this, for example, is a struct for uh, an AVL tree. It's a type of balanced search tree that uh, it uses a combination of locks and also some optimistic concurrency control techniques borrowed from the database literature. Uh, their, their optimistic concurrency control is basically so they have some sort of funny read-only transactions, hand-over-hand transactions, to avoid locking while they search. And that's sort of how they argue that their searches work. Uh, it's a rather complicated but interesting technique. Uh, and they have quite large nodes. So their nodes have a key, a value, left and right pointers, a parent pointer, this index and color variables, whatever those mean. Uh, and then they have a lock, a height, and this change OVL field. So the lock is a lock. That's obvious. The left and right child pointers and the key and value are obvious. The parent pointer is obvious. What's this change OVL? Change OVL has to do with their optimistic concurrency control techniques. So this is an optimistic validation lock. Uh, the bottom line is their nodes are, almost, are 112 bytes, which is almost two cache lines. Very large. 
And uh, this is actually one of two publicly available implementations of this data structure in C++. There's also one, and the original one is in Java. So the author's implementation's in Java, and then uh, a few people ported it to C++. And it's kind of neat. It's one of these rare cases where we have two different implementations in C++, and one of them is twice the performance of the other. And we're looking at the slower one here, and we're going to see why it's slower. And this is one of the reasons, it's bloated nodes. So it has gigantic 112-byte nodes. The first mistake these guys have made is they want a per-node lock, and that yet they've used pthread mutex t. So pthread mutex t is a super heavyweight, super general lock, which is meant for like coarse-grained synchronization. Uh, the thing is 40 bytes on its own. So you probably don't want to put a 40-byte lock into every one of your nodes in your data structure. Uh, they should have used pthread spin lock instead, which is four bytes. So we can swap that with pthread spin lock. It probably takes eight bytes of space in the struct because most of the things in the struct are, are eight byte variables and the compiler really wants to word align them. So if I stick pthread spin lock in between any pair of these, probably it'll add an extra four bytes of padding at the end, so it's really like eight bytes. Anyway, with an eight byte pthread spin lock T, that gets us down to 80 bytes. We're getting tantalizingly close to the 64 byte cache line size that we would like. Deeper optimization. So index and color, what the heck are these? These are Variables that contain small values, they, they each would actually fit in a byte. Uh, so we could just make them a short or whatever. Uh, they're, they're also set only once at the beginning of, of, uh, of a node's creation, and they're never changed after that. Uh, so you could combine those into one eight-byte field. Uh, and it turns out it's a little bit harder to reason about, but uh, the lock and the change OVL are actually always used together, and you could combine them into a single word if you were a little bit careful about the concurrency control. So I did that, and that gets us down to 64 bytes, uh, which is a cache line size. And now if you align these nodes to 64 bytes, now each node fits exactly in one cache line, and you take half as many cache misses. So now when I want to load a node, you know, I only have one cache line worth of node to load. So small, so you know, larger nodes mean fewer nodes fit in cache, which means more cache misses. So don't make things bigger unless you have to. Okay, so scattered fields is another one. So um, take the number of programmers that pay attention to object size and divide it by 10, and there you got the number that pay attention to object layout, maybe. Um, just my guess. I didn't pay attention to it until recently. Uh, so here's the same data structure, uh, and it turns out object layout here is not, not great. Because uh, in, a, in a binary search tree, uh, most of the time is spent searching. Because you got, you know, I don't know if it's like a couple million node tree, you got, you know, maybe 30 nodes to get through before you reach the place where you want to do the modification. Those are all cache, a lot of those are cache misses probably. So a lot of the time is spent searching. You'd really like to make searching as fast as possible. So if you can optimize the memory layout of your nodes for searching, you, it'll go a long way. And this memory layout is about the worst it could possibly be for searching because these are the four fields that are used by a search. So you have key, left, right. I mean, those are obvious, right? You need those in a binary search tree search. And then they also check the change OVL field. This is used for them to just check, oops, am I observing some dangerous change that's in the middle of happening? OK, if so, restart. Otherwise, keep going. So this is their sort of optimistic concurrency control stuff. And look where it is relative to key. Key is the first field in the struct. Change OVL is the last field in the struct. Uh, so assuming an 8-byte key and value and an 8-byte pthread spin lock, if I don't, uh, aggressively merge the lock and the change OVL fields, because it is kind of a pain to do that. This is like a more sane optimization. Remember when I talked about the bloated fields? I talked about merging all these fields. One of those is not really a sane transformation for your average programmer. It took me like, I don't know, 50 hours to get it right, so I wouldn't recommend that. So I, I roll back that change here. The lock and the change OVL are separate. But because of this, this is a 72-byte node. And the key and the change OVL are, are at the two endpoints of this. So you're guaranteed that key and change OVL fall into different cache lines. Um, so as you're searching, you're going to cache miss twice on every single node. And uh, if, I mean, you know, four things are being accessed, this is 32 bytes worth of stuff. It could fit in a single cache line. Yep. Yes. This is in the C spec. This comes from the fact that structs were used for decoding images or whatever. You read binary data directly into a struct and then access its values. So it's in the C spec that these fields cannot be reordered. So they really are in this order. That's not true in Java. <laughs> Good luck doing this in Java. It, it, you can actually change the order of fields by flipping them around, but it's not necessarily changing in the way you think it is. 
It's sort of like uh, if you poke it enough, you'll get a new random dice roll. And then <laughs> you can introspect and see what you got and keep trying. <laughs> So it's a bit more random, the process. I, I like C++ for this kind of work, be, and especially for teaching it, and especially for experimenting, because I can actually understand what's happening, whereas in Java, there's, there's just a lot of layers I have to work through to, to get to an understanding. Okay, so what should I do in this case? This is 32 bytes of stuff. This could easily fit in a cache line. What if I just move this all to the top of the, the struct, right? Okay, so, so I'll move it all to the top, and uh, that, uh, that doubles the performance of the data structure. Those two changes. So shrink the nodes, move the stuff that you access a lot at the top, boom, double the performance. So, so the comment was that shrinking didn't really work because you, I ended up with 72 bytes instead of the desired 64. Well, I did have a really hardcore shrink that I did where I merged the lock and the change OVL, and that did work. That did make it. But Mm, I wouldn't expect anyone else to dig into the concurrency control of it and start merging like actual like live variables, lo merging locks and <laughs> concurrency control mechanisms. Oh, sorry. Will I share benchmarks of this stuff? So uh, uh, all of this stuff was actually covered uh, in, in great detail in a, a, a Usenix ATC paper called uh, Getting to the Root of Concurrent Search Tree Performance. Um, uh, it's a paper that I was on, last year's Usenix ATC. Uh, for, for, for this? So, so uh, yeah, the version before either of these fixes and after these two fixes, it, it doubles almost exactly. Yeah. Yes, in this, in this case, the reordering is enough. That is true. Um, there are times when the amount of stuff that you access because of an inefficient layout is quite large and it doesn't need to be. And then shrinking is, is even more relevant. It's still a good idea to shrink it. it it'll cause, uh, you can have funny issues with like cache associativity and things if you have things that don't need to be two cache lines but, but are. And now all of your cache lines uh, are, are uh, on even, uh, even multiples of 128 and <laughs> funny patterns emerge and you get associativity misses. And so it, it's still preferable to shrink stuff Mostly, there's one exception to that, which I'll talk about next, one, or at least one strange exception that people should know about. Yep. Uh, does it work to make this node uh, a little bit smaller to uh, fit only one cache line? For example, we know that in AVL3 we have different operations, like for search we can use only this first uh, compact part, but for balancing, which is um, only for updates operation, we need additional structures like parent, uh, color, and height. Maybe we can compact this and move into another structure and use only for updates. Okay, so you're suggesting may, what would happen if you took the node and broke it into like a, a few structs. Right. The, the update parts of the struct maybe, and then the search part of the struct is in the, is in the base node. And you have like a pointer to another struct that contains all the update stuff. Yes, yes. So you could do that. Um, you might take an extra cache miss going to the update part of the struct. So it's a trade-off. Um, that would be per perhaps, depending on how dominant the search costs are, if there was no other way to shrink the node, uh, maybe that would be a good idea. But often, uh, if you just want to optimize for searches, it's enough to take the fields that searches access most often and move them to the top. Because okay, then so even if the whole thing is big, you know, they only have to load the cache line containing the stuff that they access, and it's okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay. So, uh, now we're going to get into... Uh, a little bit about uh, sl slow memory allocation, which is uh, another thing that bites you a lot in a uh, you know, h highly multi-threaded concurrent situation. Uh, it turns out that uh, the default you know, glibc allocator that uh, comes with most distributions is uh, not particularly well suited to very parallel workloads. Uh, you know, I think it's often like a PC malloc or, or uh, sorry, PT malloc or uh, you know, PHK malloc or a few, you know, a few other sort of uh, simple guys that are really, really fast in the common case for sequential allocation. If you have one thread, they're just super fast. 
And then if you have maybe four to eight threads, they're, they're fairly reasonable. And then as soon as you start to get beyond that, the allocation curve, you know, the, the number of allocations you get per second, you know, if this x-axis is number of threads and the y-axis is allocations per second, the graph doesn't even, it doesn't even flatten off like this. It starts to go negative and get <laughs> very poor as the thread count gets very high, or it can. Um, and this is because, uh, you know, glibc is tuned for, to, to work for a wide range of programs and, a lot of those programs are sequential or small thread count. And so you, if you want to have a concurrent data structure where there's a lot of memory allocation, like a lot of nodes are allocated for inserts, for example, uh, oftentimes it makes a lot of sense to use a fast thread caching allocator that's, that's designed for this particular use. So JE malloc is a good example of one such allocator. It was, uh, it's actually the, the default al allocator in FreeBSD. So if you have FreeBSD, you are, are already using it. Um, it's also the default allocator in Firefox, and it's used extensively at Facebook, and so on. Uh, it's, a, it's one that I tend to recommend a lot because its results are, are very predictable. They're very repeatable, very reliable, very predictable. There, there are, as far as I can tell, there aren't really any cases where it does horribly. Most of the allocators I've messed with, they have cases where they do better than JMalloc, but they also have cases where they do horribly. <laughs> JMalloc is very stable. It doesn't really have awful cases. So let's give you some idea of how JMalloc, an allocator like JMalloc works. Uh, so it's actually kind of uh, an example of sharding or partitioning to greatly reduce contention in the common case. So in some sense, threads uh, kind of have private heaps. They're not really private heaps. Stuff does get communicated between those heaps. Um, but yeah, threads typically allocate from private arenas. And so each thread has an arena for each size class. Uh, you know, there are many more size classes than that that are larger than that, but I just listed most people probably aren't allocating millions of nodes that are bigger than 512 bytes, so these are the sizes you probably care about. And uh, so you have a bunch of arenas per thread. So here's kind of a picture of one thread, and you can roughly speaking think of an arena as a 4096 byte page, and you're just going to bump allocate from that page. So for example, let's say I want a malloc 48. So what will happen, I'll bump allocate from my 48 byte size class. So, so this is a particular thread, P, it's doing malloc, it's going to bump allocate a 48 byte object from its 48 byte size class. What if we allocate size 36? That'll get rounded up to the next larger size class, so that'll also get bump allocated 48 bytes of space. 40, 44, 32, this gets allocated from the 32 byte size class. 17, that also gets allocated from that size class, 40 and so on, and eventually when a size class fills up, when an arena fills up, uh, we replace it with a new page and keep bump allocating. Now there's more to this, there are free lists, you know, when you free, things get returned to free lists and things get moved around to shared pools and okay, there's more than this, but roughly speaking in the common case, uh, this is how you sort of grow your memory space, you're just bump allocating from, from empty pages or this is, this is your own page that you yourself are able to bump allocate alone from. So there's basically no synchronization involved because no one else is bump allocating from this, it's just you. Okay, so now that I've shown you how that works, uh, I can explain this concept of cache line crossings. So it turns out that not all size classes are equal. Size matters. So if you look at the eight byte size class, the 16 byte size class, the 32 and the 64, no node allocated from those size classes will ever occupy two cache lines. They always fit entirely into one cache line. This is a behavior of the JMalloc allocator. You don't have to ask for alignment. If you allocate a 64-byte object or a 56-byte object, anything that goes in the 64-byte size class, you're getting 64-byte alignment. That's just the property of the allocator. Now, the 48-byte size class is kind of funny because you're getting 48-byte alignment, which means half of all your nodes are occupying two cache lines. So uh, in general, it's better that your objects are smaller so more of them fit in cache, but there's this funny exception <laughs> because at 48 bytes, half of your objects occupy two cache lines. So if you have a 48 byte node and your data structure is too big to fit in cache, so you are experiencing cache misses on some nodes, it may actually be much better to artificially blow up the size of your nodes and just make them 64 bytes so that when you cache miss on one of these things, you don't have to load two cache lines, you just have to load one. So 
this is not really a big deal if your data structure fits in cache. If it, if it all fits in cache, who cares? You're not cache missing anyway. It makes no difference how these things are laid out. But if it doesn't fit in cache, this is something to watch out for. It's generally good to shrink things. But you know, different allocators will behave differently, and so you have to watch out for behaviors like this. So one of my steps in sort of figuring out what's going on with data structures, if I'm comparing two data structures, I look at their cache misses, and I just reason about the algorithm. I think, is there really a justification for these cache misses, and where are they coming from? And I start printing out the addresses of nodes that are allocated and seeing what their alignments are and seeing if they cross, cross cache lines and seeing what's next to them on cache lines and how they're laid out into pages. And all this stuff, paying attention to memory layout can actually make a big difference. So, so this issue of crossing cache lines can make sort of like a 50% performance difference in some algorithms. So it's actually better sometimes to just make your node a bit bigger to avoid this. Okay, so this is the uh, last performance problem I'll talk about. Uh, this is uh, cache set associativity problems which is a bit of a mouthful. So uh, we have this concept of, of cache sets and cache associativity in modern processors. You, you look at a processor and you see, oh, it's eight-way associative, it's 16-way associative, it's 22-way associative. What does that mean? Well, uh, I'll give you a model for this here that's pretty simple, simple enough to reason about. So think of the cache sort of like a hash table. I hope everyone here knows what a, what a hash table is, yeah? <laughs> okay, I'm not going to describe what a hash table is, don't worry. <laughs> so think of the cache like a hash table, although in a hash table usually your buckets are maybe like a linked list, something like that. I imagine in the cache it's not a linked list, it's a, it's a fixed size array. And the array size is the associativity. Okay, so it's a, if, you have a, if you have a 22 way associative cache, then the cache is a hash table with a bunch of buckets and each bucket has 22 slots. So uh, we're going to study an AMD Opteron system here in this example, and uh, they have uh, 4096 buckets, 4096 cache sets on that processor. And on that system, the associativity is 64. This is the L3 cache and the L3 associativity. Uh, so uh, each bucket can contain up to 64 elements. Okay, and I, I said it's like a hash table, right? Because you've got to take a, a, an address of a cache line and hash it to a bucket. So how do you hash a cache line address to a bucket? You compute its physical address, and you take it mod 4096. Is this a good hash function? Mod 4096? <laughs> Arguably not. OK, so, so how does this work? If you, if you load an address, you figure out what bucket that cache line maps to, you put the cache line in the bucket, and now the thread can use it. It's in its cache. Uh, what if you load an address and it maps to a full bucket? Well, it has to go somewhere. You kick something else out of that bucket, right? So that you, you evict something because you've exceeded the associativity of the cache. And so if someone then tries to access that evicted line that was evicted because the bucket was full, we say that's an associativity cache miss. Okay, so, th so this is really an interesting hash function. Um, and this, this hash function actually leads to real problems because patterns in allocation can lead to patterns in bucket occupancy. So uh, here's an example of this really happening. Uh, so here's uh, a tale of cache set usage in a lock-free internal binary search tree. This is a tree due to Halley and Jones, published in 2012. Uh, you, don't, you, all, you need to know almost nothing about this algorithm to understand this example. All you need to know is that whenever you do an insert, you allocate two objects, one after another. You allocate a node, which is 64 bytes, and then you allocate a descriptor object, which is also in the 64-byte size class. So you allocate these two different objects, both of them in the 64-byte size class. OK, so what does this look like? Here's a JE Malloc Arena for size class 64. And let's say we do a bunch of insertions to, to fill up a data structure. You know, we're, I don't know, inserting into a table in a database, and the index is getting rows inserted into the index. The index is our tree. OK, so we do an insert. We allocate a node, descriptor. Do another insert, allocate a node, descriptor. Do another insert, allocate a node, descriptor. So we have a very regular allocation pattern here. If we do like a million inserts, we're going to get node, descriptor, node, descriptor, node, descriptor, node, descriptor in this, in, in, allocated in our uh, arenas. So remember, an arena is just a page of contiguous memory. So 
what this means is within this page, all of our nodes are going to be at addresses that are a multiple of 128. And all of our descriptors are going to be at addresses that are a multiple of 128, shifted by 64. So if you take all these addresses and you divide them by 64 to get like an index of their, their cache line, like the cache line number in the page. The first node here, this is cache line 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, all the nodes are at even numbered cache lines, and all the descriptors are at odd numbered cache lines. Now, what happens if we then run lots of searches on this tree that results from these insertions? So searches in this algorithm, they only access nodes. They don't access the descriptors. The descriptors are only used for this sort of lock-free helping mechanism that's used for their updates. So searches don't read descriptors at all. So what would you hope? You would hope that if you did an all-search workload for a while, the cache would only contain nodes, right? It would, the cache would be storing your, your nodes and not wasting space on other junk that you don't need to accelerate your searches. So ideally, the cache should contain only nodes. And so let's ask which cache sets, which buckets in the cache will these nodes map to? Well, the cache indexes that are used, as I mentioned, they're even numbered. What happens when I take even numbers mod 4096? I get even numbers, right? So only the even numbered cache buckets are used to store nodes. That means only half of the cache is used to store nodes. So about 51% of the cache is storing other junk, even though only nodes are being accessed for minutes on end. And this is because of associativity. So, uh, well, uh, here's a silly fix. If the problem is this rigid, even odd allocation behavior, then uh, why not break it up? So we did this funny thing where every thousand allocations, we flipped a coin. And if it was heads, we just allocated an extra dummy 64-byte chunk of memory. This breaks up the even odd allocation pattern, and it wastes you know, one two thousandth of our memory for 64-byte nodes. Eh, not a big deal. I mean, could have done something smarter, didn't have to waste it. And that fixes it. It reduces the unused cache sets from 50.1% to 1.6%, and it improves the search performance by 41% in this data structure. Uh, I think it's, uh, so the question was, why do CPUs need associativity? So associativity is a, it's a, I think it's a physical property of the actual memory. I, I think it's related to a physical property of the memory that's, that's used for the cache. It's desirable to have associativity because it's like a map lookup. Like you feed an address in and it gives you, it's like, a, it's like a mini key value store actually. You feed an address in and it just instantly gives you the answer back. And uh, it's, it's a key value store of bounded size and that's the associativity. So it, it's desirable to have that behavior because I want to feed an address and just get back the cache line if it exists. Um, and we only know how to build those so big without it being super expensive. Yep. Yeah, so, there, so the question was, would it, would it be advantageous if before the search part, you told the allocator maybe to rearrange memory to make the, you know, the search phase better? To, to utilize cache sets better. So in C++, uh, typically memory addresses are sacred. We don't uh, do like copying, garbage collecting, or anything like that in C++ because the programmer has access to addresses, and who knows what he's doing with them. <laughs> he might be changing their, rep their representation somehow, you know, uh, stealing some of their bits, you know, uh, XORing them with other stuff and encoding them in funny ways and then taking them back later and accessing them. So if you tried to write some sort of like allocator or garbage collector that moved nodes, you'd have a hard time detecting these disguised pointers and, and the rewriting them. Because when you, when you move memory, you have to rewrite the, the thread's pointers to this stuff. And uh, if you're aware of it as a programmer, it's easy enough to do this kind of dummy allocation thing. If you're aware of it as the designer of a memory allocator, you can try to design your memory allocator in such a way that it kind of does this sort of stuff for you. So there are various approaches to tackle it. Yep. Yeah. 
So the, the problem is, uh, even if these things don't stick around in the cache, the descriptors, even if the descriptors all fall out of the cache, whenever you try to load a node, you're going to try to hash it to a bucket to figure out where to store it in the cache. And no matter what, because the addresses of the nodes are all multiples of 128, you're always going to hash to an, an, an even-numbered bucket. And so the, even, if you, even if you let all the descriptors and whatever else drain out of the odd-numbered buckets, you'd never put a node into an odd-numbered bucket, because when you hash the node to figure out where to put it in the cache, it goes to an even-numbered bucket. So you have to change the allocation pattern so that some of the nodes now hash to odd-numbered buckets, and we'll go there. Why, uh, sorry, can you repeat? Why are the nodes mapping to even-numbered buckets? Why is it bad? Oh, it's not the fact that even-numbered buckets are bad or odd-numbered buckets are bad. It's a bad idea if uh, no nodes can ever map to an odd-numbered bucket. If there are some buckets that nodes can never map to, then those buckets can't hold nodes. So it's bad for any part of the cache to be unusable by nodes because there's a nasty interaction between the addresses of the nodes and the quote-unquote hash function that decides where to put them in the, in the cache. Yeah? So uh, the odd numbers that we need are, are the number of cache lines. So, so this, this is number 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this is node 0, node 2, node 4. So now look where the nodes are. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So now the nodes are at 0, 3, and 5. So some of those are odd numbers. Yep. Yep. Yes. Yeah, I, I think I get, yeah, I get your question. So, so, so the question was, uh, once I add these dummy allocations, now nodes map to even-numbered and odd-numbered cache buckets, and descriptors also map to even-numbered and odd-numbered buckets. So shouldn't the cache be half full of nodes and half full of descriptors still? Well, the cache also uses like a least recently used eviction policy. So yeah, if the descriptors aren't accessed recently, they'll all flush out, and as long as nodes can be placed in all the, the hash sets, eventually they will be filling up all the, all the hash buckets. And search only touches nodes. It doesn't touch the descriptors, so yeah. OK. So uh, now I'm going to throw a curveball your way. Uh, that was on an AMD system that this fixed the problem. On an Intel system, it didn't fix the problem. So there are more architectural issues at play. A hint is it has to do with prefetching. Uh, if you're curious to see the, de the details, then here's a, a sort of a, a reference to uh, the, uh, the Usenix ATC paper that I mentioned. <laughs> it has you know, much deeper details for all sorts of performance issues like this, if you're curious about that kind of thing. Cryptographic hash function in the <laughs> in the cache sets. Yeah, uh, it, it would. So the question was, uh, you know, uh, do you think CPU uh, manufacturers might actually change the hash function so it's not modulo 4096 or something silly like that? Um, do I think they will do it? I, I mean, I don't know. I, do I think they should do it? Maybe. I I I don't know enough about the design of CPUs to know if there's a good reason why this is the exact hash function. Uh, may, perhaps, you know, cache accesses are supposed to be so fast that maybe you just don't have time to compute anything else. I, I, I don't know. It would be nice if there were a slightly different hash function. But we can try to work around it a little bit <laughs> in software. Okay, so uh, looks like I'm not going to have too much time to cover some stuff. So uh, we'll cover non-uniform memory architectures, and then uh, I think we'll leave some of the... Uh, I think this is an important thing to understand if you do any sort of work in this area. I, I think we'll, we'll uh, not discuss 
uh, too much stuff on the, on the debugging or performance. We'll probably just have time to get mostly through this non-uniform memory architecture stuff. Uh, like, like other stuff, probably a lot of you guys have already seen. The other stuff I was going to talk about was just like using Google's address sanitizer to you know, find memory leaks and bugs and uh, uh, you know, using perf record and perf stat. Anyway, there are slides for those things which mostly teach themselves. So if you're curious about those things, uh, there are some extra slides in the talk that maybe you guys can take a peek at if, you're, if you want to see them. Uh, okay, so, so let's look at non-uniform memory architectures a little bit. And we'll have to revisit cache coherence a little bit to do that. So, uh, so far, you've probably been imagining a single socket system with a uniform memory architecture. Most of us have these on our desks or on our laps. Um, uh, you know, I, I don't know anybody who has a dual socket laptop. That would be cool. Right? Most of us have dual socket phones, to be fair. So uh, let's add some missing details to our model of uh, cache coherence on Yuma, and that will sort of lead us naturally into cache coherence on NUMA and how it differs and how it should change your algorithm design. So here is uh, a slightly more nuanced picture of the uh, memory hierarchy on a Yuma system. So this is uh, a less simple version of the picture I described before that just said each thread has a cache. So in reality, each core has its own caches. Each core has several different caches. So each core typically has a private L1 data and L1 instruction cache. They're usually around 32K. Um, each core usually has a private L2 data and L2 instruction caches in the, in the realm of 256K. And then uh, the instruction caches are usually not particularly interesting. The number of times where I've found a performance issue and it has to do with the instruction cache is like one in a thousand compared to the 999 times where it's actually the L3 data cache. So the shared L3, in my mind, is the interesting part. This is sort of in the realm of four to 40 megs. Although AMD's Epic 2 chips that are coming up in the third quarter of this year are supposed to have 256 meg L3 caches, which is kind of interesting, these are large, relatively large. And this is, I claim, the L3 cache is where most of the savings come in, you know, versus accessing main memory. You know, to me, if I write a fast concurrent program, I usually pay almost no attention to the L1 and L2 misses. I'm just looking at the L3 misses. Okay, so a load brings a cache line into all three caches, and a store invalidates the L1 and L2 cached copies. So, so this, is, this is a model that I'm describing, right? I'm not describing one particular architecture, I'm describing the model that's roughly speaking something you can map onto a lot of popular architectures today. Okay, so a store invalidates the L1 and L2 cached copies of whatever you're writing to, what, but it doesn't invalidate the L3. Why doesn't it, why doesn't it invalidate the L3? So the L3 is shared. Why would I invalidate the shared cache? You can just read from, from our shared L3. Okay, so, so writes are destructive, right, because they cause, it to, to performance, because they cause these L1 and L2 cache misses for other threads, but they don't cause L3 cache misses for other threads on a, on a UMA system. Okay, now let's look at a NUMA system. So this is like a multi-socket system. You know, you have multiple sockets. You have, you know, RAM banks that are associated with each socket. And uh, these are, you know, NUMA effects are very common in dual and quad socket servers. Data, data, data centers are full of dual socket servers these days. Um, saves rack space. So you have different NUMA nodes on the same system. Uh, conceptually, it's one system that you're using as one OS. It's, it's, not, it's not like several computers in one system. It's just you have multiple physical processors and multiple RAM banks that have different physical connections to the different processors. So you have these NUMA nodes that the system is divided into uh, conceptually, logically. Each NUMA node typically has a physical processor socket, some RAM that's local to it, some RAM that's remote. So the, the, you know, you, I've sort of drawn the NUMA nodes around the RAM that's local to the socket in this picture. And you can sort of see visually what the remote RAM is, right? If NUMA node zero, this, this, this processor wants to access this RAM, there's got to be some funky communication to, to electrically to get from here to here. So it's more costly to access the RAM that's electrically further away. And you have private per core L1 and L2 caches, and then you have a shared L3 cache. Wait, it's not a shared L3 cache. It's, it's a shared L3 cache per NUMA node. So it's shared between threads that are running on that NUMA node, on that socket. It's not shared for threads running on different sockets. That's a crucial 
difference here. So what are the big differences between Yuma and Numa? So Yuma, there's no concept of local or remote RAM, it's just RAM. The L3 cache is shared by all threads. Writes never invalidate the L3 cache. Thread placement and pinning has kind of a minimal effect. So thread placement or pinning is when you say, like, this process can only run on that logical processor. Don't run anywhere else. You know, doing that uh, doesn't have much of a, an effect on a Yuma system. Now, on a Numa system, this is a different story. So this local and remote RAM, depending on what you're doing in terms of latency, is typically 10 to 50% overhead to access remote RAM in terms of latency. Uh, throughput, it's actually sometimes better to engage all of the RAM uh, uh, slots, all of the RAM channels. So if, you, if throughput is what you're interested in, it's often better to use all of the RAM on all of the sockets, even if you only want to run on one, your, your, your threads on one socket. Uh, from a latency standpoint, it hurts to go to remote RAM. Uh, the L3 cache is shared only within a single socket. Writes do invalidate L3 caches. So this is the big difference. This is the, the critical difference between Yuma and Numa. On Yuma, threads don't invalidate the L3 cache when they write. On Numa, they do. They invalidate the L3 caches on other sockets. And thread placement, because of this, has a huge impact. So roughly speaking, if two threads are running on the same Numa node, it's as if they're running in a Yuma system. And if threads are running on different Numa nodes, you have L3 caching. You have tons of extra L3 cache misses which means tons more actual writes to memory. OK, so let's look at two examples of uh, what cache coherence looks like in action on a two-socket two NUMA system. And this is where I'll, I'll end the talk on these two examples. OK, so here we have a two-socket system. Uh, we have an interconnect that connects the L3 caches so the two sockets can communicate with one another. Uh, not all systems allow direct communication between the, the L3 caches. This diagram happens to, um, we'll sort of consider both cases. Uh, so uh, what happens if we want to do, as an example, two threads running on the same socket, doing the hand over hand locking that we saw earlier? What does this look like on this more extensive cache coherence model? What actually happens as these, these threads run? So here we'll have thread one running on core one, thread two running on core two. I, I have the threads you know, drawn on the architecture diagram and also semantically what they're doing in the program over there. So both the threads want to read A because they want to see if its, if its lock is held. It's like a test and test and set lock, and they're trying to lock it. So they want to read the lock and see if it's held, and then they want to lock it as the first step of their hand over hand locking algorithm. So suppose thread one reads. So when it reads, it's going to look in its L1 cache. It's going to miss, look in the L2 and miss, look in the L3 and miss. It's going to go to main memory. Suppose that that node A is stored in the main memory that's local to socket one. So it fetches the node from main memory, loads it into all three caches in shared mode. And now suppose thread two wants to read. So thread two is going to look in its L1, miss, look in the L2, miss, look in the L3. It's going to hit in the L3. So it hits in the L3 and it loads copies into its L2 and L1 caches in shared mode as well. Now thread one wants to lock, wants to acquire the lock. So it's going to do like a test and set atomic instruction. So in order to do that, it has to acquire these cache lines in exclusive mode. So what does it do? It marks its first you know, L1 cache copy as exclusive, and it also has to invalidate the cached copy for thread one in its L1 cache. Then it marks the L2 as exclusive, marks thread two's L2 as invalid, and then it marks the L3 as exclusive. There's no invalidation for that step, because the L3 is shared. OK, so now suppose it's locked, and uh, we're going to start switching these back to shared. Because we've done the test and set, the atomic test and set that locked. In the cache coherence protocol, we're going to switch all these cache lines back to shared mode. So we switch these back to shared mode. And now suppose thread two, now it wants to do a test and set and lock. So it has to acquire these cache lines in exclusive mode. But first, it's going to miss in the cache because these are invalid. It's going to say, this is invalid. I have to go deeper. This is invalid. I have to go deeper. Oh, I hit in the L3. And then I pull an up-to-date copy into these caches, take them in exclusive mode, do the test and set, and so on. So this is nice. Because these are running on the same socket, these threads can repeatedly modify node A without ever going to main memory after the first load. First thread loads it from main memory. After that, the deepest that this thing gets pushed back up is the L3 until eventually it gets flushed 
it can sit in the L3 for a really long time and we can avoid going to main memory. Okay, so is this true if threads are running on different sockets? No, we'll see exactly what happens here. So again, we have two threads. This time they're just running on different sockets. Okay, so suppose again, thread one wants to read. It's gonna miss, 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 go to main memory. It's gonna load A into each of its caches. And now it wants to, uh, or suppose thread two wants to read. So it's gonna miss, miss. This time it's missing in the L3 because it's not on the same L3, it's not shared, it's missing. It has to go, oh, it could go to this L3 perhaps and go, go borrow the cache line from there, get a copy from there. Uh, let's just suppose that it, the other alternative is it goes to main memory. So let, let's suppose that in this particular architecture it goes to main memory. In this case, this would be a remote memory read because it's reading from the memory on the other socket. So it'll get a copy of the cache line and put it in its three caches. Okay, now suppose T1 locks. It does the test and set to lock. So it acquires these cache lines in exclusive mode. It marks them as invalid on socket two. Now notice there's an L3 invalidation. And because of this L3 invalidation, now when thread two comes to write, it's gonna miss in the L1, miss in the L2, miss in the L3 and go to main memory again. So stuff is no longer kind of stopping you know, at the level of the L3, we're repeatedly going to main memory to fetch over and over again because we're running on different sockets. So what are the additional overheads here? We have two extra remote memory reads, two extra L3 cache misses, potentially an L3 flush, uh, extra coherence traffic across the bus. This is tons of overhead. And in my mind, this is the big difference between programming for NUMA and programming for Yuma. You need to avoid these misses in the L3 cache if you can. Do anything you can programmatically to avoid those L3 misses. So how can you avoid them? You can put threads on the same socket so that they don't have those L3 misses. You know, if you're running only as many threads as you could, like if you could fit all the threads on one socket, put them on one socket so you don't get those L3 misses. Uh, otherwise, you have to look at your algorithms and see when I do these writes, you know, do I really need lots of communication between the threads on the two sockets? Or maybe can I organize my data structures in a hierarchical way? So instead of doing tons of reads that all have to be communicated across the bus to the other socket, I can maybe aggregate a bunch of reads and, 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 or a bunch of writes and just do one write and have that travel across the socket more efficiently. So just to give a very rough hint of how that works. Okay, so I won't, it looks like I'm out of time, I think. Yeah, I'm out of time. So I, so I won't go into this, but uh, if you want to look at, you know, more into NUMA effects, I'd suggest the lock cohorting paper by Dave Dice, Verandra Mar Marathe, and Nir Shavit. And uh, there are some other slides, which obviously don't have time to go through, pretty pictures and so on. So if you want to see those, then uh, they, I think they do more or less teach themselves. So, and there's bonus slides at the end. So thank you for coming. Feel free to have a look at the talk. I'll be happy to talk more. <laughs> We have some time for maybe two, three questions, Max. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk, really enjoyed it. Um, I'm just curious if you could kind of speculatively comment on the, um, some of the new kind of emerging architectures that are workload specific like TPUs and graph core chips and sort of how that changes the whole kind of programming paradigm around performance and like compute versus memory and just sort of like how many of those principles are going to be transferable and which ones are going to have to be sort of reinvented. Okay, so uh, as you go to all of these funny heterogeneous, okay, so I, I guess I don't need to repeat the question because it was in the speakers, but uh, when you go to all these funny heterogeneous architectures, uh, I, I think the concepts that you learn in doing this kind of NUMA aware stuff are really helpful because all that happens is things get way more and more NUMA <laughs> and you get a few extra funny characteristics thrown in. Like if you're working on GPUs, you have to learn that any communication with the GPU has to be a batch. You know, so you have, it's, it's sort of like aggressively non-uniform memory architectures with these funny little extra constraints thrown in. And you know, just like you learn to dodge scenarios where you have unnecessary L3 cache invalidations in a NUMA system, you learn to dodge, you know, other specific problems like with non-volatile RAM, you learn to dodge unnecessary CL flushes and persistence barriers, and with GPUs you learn to, 
you know, carefully batch things and, and find the appropriate batch sizes so you don't, you know, uh, suffer from high latencies. And I think there, there are unique problems to each of these kinds of architectures that you add to the picture when you're doing heterogeneous computing. But I think the, the process of, of working around these uh, architecture-specific limitations is, is very transferable. You can get, get used to thinking that way. Hello, thank you for the talk. Um, do you know if uh, Redis, that is known to have a, a fast uh, concurrent dictionary, uh, is implemented in uh, one of the way you demonstrate? Uh, okay, so I, uh, sorry, the speakers are also facing that way, so it's a little bit hard for me to hear. So I, I, I think I heard you were asking about Redis. Okay, and you were saying it has fast concurrent data structures, and then uh, I didn't hear the rest. <laughs> Is it as fast as what you demonstrated before? Oh, uh, no, not really. Um, so, so Redis data structures, I, I, I don't want to say something that's incorrect, but I, I, I see every now and then papers that take a data structure more like this, and they drop it into Redis, and they show a big improvement in performance. So these kinds of papers show up every now and then. So I, I haven't used Redis a lot myself, but I've seen you know, some research papers that try to take these kinds of data structures and drop them in to Redis to replace existing Redis data structures, and, and usually they find a big performance improvement. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so I was a bit surprised uh, but for you, about your statement that uh, it's L3 cache that is important, because my intuition was that when, for example, you partition the workload, uh, my intuition would be that it's important to fit like these partitions in L2 cache so that uh, cores won't interfere with each other. So mm -hmm. what, how do you comment on, on this intuition? So what's the partitioning that you're talking about? Like uh, the stuff that we talked about in the first part, like when you divide your workloads between threads. Okay. So if we're talking about the, the sort of the first half of the talk when we were, we were doing like mostly yes, partitioning yes. stuff, then uh, I probably wouldn't worry about the caches at all, because when you're partitioning, uh, fundamentally you're, you're, you're writing to stuff that's you know, all been reserved for your own exclusive access. So you're, you're almost by definition not conflicting with anyone, except maybe at the boundaries of the regions that you've reserved for yourself, or you might have some false sharing. So in partitioned workloads, I, I almost wouldn't worry about the caches at all, where the caches are a big deal, in my mind, is in these kinds of workloads where we have a lot of uh, data sharing and a lot of uh, you know, concurrency where threads are, are reading and writing to the same locations. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that case, uh, you want to do everything you can to exploit the shared L3 cache. Uh, okay. And Numa just makes it harder to exploit the shared L3 cache. So you try to, you try to find ways to exploit as much as you can <laughs> of the shared L3 cache, which means minimizing communication across the L3 caches and maximizing it within the L3 caches, if that makes sense. Well, uh, thanks. So you, you are, of course, you are free to bug uh, Trevor after yep. we, we finish during the lunch break or uh, for the rest of the uh, school. Okay, thank you very much. Right. Thanks. <laughs>